Good morning and welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council online briefing for community and faith partners. Today's program features tools and funding resources to green congregations. A special thanks, the San Francisco Interfaith Council online briefings are supported by a grant from MetaFund. Thank you. The important and ongoing work of the San Francisco Interfaith Council would not be possible without generous funding from congregations, corporations, faith-based social service agencies, foundations, judicatories, and supporters like you. Help us spread the word. Visit sfinterfaithcouncil.org to learn about SFIC programming and how to become a supporter. Follow SFIC on Facebook and Twitter. And subscribe to SFIC's YouTube channel to watch all of our virtual events. A bit of housekeeping. Today's program is being recorded. For audio and video, all participants are muted and without video to minimize distraction. For chat, you can submit a question or comment by selecting the chat button at the bottom of your screen and sending a message to Q&A. Questions will be forwarded to the host and answered time permitting. For closed captions, select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click enable live transcription. Now is the time to stand together San Francisco. Together we can stop anti-Asian discrimination, bias, hate, and violence. The COVID-19 virus has no race or nationality, it is simply a disease. To report a hate crime, call the SFPD at 415-553-1133. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey. Good morning. I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I want to welcome you to this week's online briefing for community and faith partners. It's in the DNA of communities of faith to not only preach and teach about respect for the environment, but more importantly, to lead by example by being good stewards of the environment. This week's online briefing for community and faith partners hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council will focus on ways houses of worship and religious institutions can update their facilities to become more energy efficient and save on their energy bills. Additionally, the presentation led by Sarah Paulos, Community Engagement and Programs Director of Interfaith Power and Light National, and Gregory Stevens, Northern California Interfaith Power and Light Director, will share important information regarding first-time federal funding available to nonprofits to support investment in energy efficient and renewables and inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. As we do at the beginning of each of these programs, allow me to read this interfaith statement. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. To ground us uh, in a reflective moment on this very, very important topic, uh, we are very honored and privileged to have with us the founder of Interfaith Power and Light and past chair, uh, uh, the Reverend Canon Sally Bingham. Uh, Sally, I, I have known you for many, many years. Uh, uh, you're one of my sheroes, as they say, and uh, we are thankful. Uh, for your presence here today, and I would offer you the floor to ground us in this reflective moment. Well, I'm going to begin with a statement that came from the United Nations Sabbath. We join with the earth and with each other to bring new life to the land, to restore the waters, to refresh the air. We join with the earth and with each other to renew the forest, to care for the plants, to protect the creatures. We join with the earth and with each other to celebrate the seas, to rejoice in the sunlight, to sing the song of the stars. 
We join with the earth and with each other to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving memory for the healing of the earth and renewal of all life. I wanna thank you, Michael, for the honor of being with the Interfaith Council today. And thank you to all the people that are listening in and watching us. If you're looking for ways to find um, protection of creation and to green your congregation, this is the place to be this morning. Congregations serve as examples to their congregants, but they also serve as examples to the communities. When someone sees solar on a roof of a congregation, it shows people that it can be done, it should be done, and it is being done. You will hear from Sarah and Gregory on the many things beyond solar that are large and small, that are also signs of good stewardship. Most of us uh, are, are, can, I'm sorry, something went wrong here. Uh, that uh, they're going to show us signs of good stewardship. And most of that, those retrofits and efficiencies are that you make changes will save money as well as saving creation. Let us pray. Oh, holy and wondrous one who answers to many names from many different traditions. We call upon you this morning for guidance and wisdom. Help us to respect one another, to listen and to hear each other. Keep us calm and respectful as we explore ways to better serve and protect this fragile earth. Give us the grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Bless this gathering and those who are participating with us. All this we pray in the name of our traditional divine leader. Amen. Amen. And thank you again, Sally. Uh, you know, as I introduce uh, uh, Sarah and Gregory, I just would like to say a word. Um, you know, our constituencies are diverse and vast in San Francisco. We count as our constituents the 800 communities and faith uh, and religious institutions. Uh, and we are a staff of two. And so what, what has happened as a result is that um, interfaith coalitions on single issues have emerged. And Interfaith Power and Light is a very, very important interfaith coalition. And whenever there are uh, matters relating to the environment, uh, it is to IPL that I, uh, I direct them. And so we are very, very grateful today for the presence of Sarah Paulos, the Community Engagement and Programs Director for Interfaith Power and Light, who is with us from Montana, and Gregory Stevens, the Northern California Director of California Interfaith Power and Light. And he, their offices are in Oakland, but he is with us in the mission today. Uh, so we thank you both. And I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. The only thing I would say is to our attendees today, as you're listening, uh, Think of questions that you might want to ask and, and send them over to Q&A. And in the discussion portion at the end, uh, we'll try to get to them all. Uh, lady and gentlemen, the, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for that beautiful opening, Sally. Much appreciated. I'm really happy to be here today and to speak to you all. Um, I just want to tell you about Interfaith Power and Light inspires and mobilizes people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. We work with 22,000 plus congregations of all faiths nationwide to educate, advocate, and take action to reduce emissions in congregations and member homes. And we have a network of 40 some state affiliates, including California. Um, next slide. And I'll first talk about Thanks, could you go to the next slide for me? Thank you, that's it. I'm gonna talk about why this is a great time to cut your energy bills, the basic process of reducing your energy use at a congregation, 
and share some resources. Then Gregory will tell you about California IPL and what they have to offer to help your congregation or organization reduce energy bills and climate, climate change pollution. Next slide. Why us? Let's go to the next slide. Why us? Why is it important for a congregation to reduce climate change pollution? In addition to what Sally said, all the world's major religious traditions call their believers to love their neighbor and care for our sacred earth that supports us all. When we cut our energy use, we cut climate change pollution that is adversely impacting people's ability to survive around the world. It's how we care for our neighbor. We are the moral leaders in our community and climate change is a moral issue. Next. And why now? The Inflation Reduction Act, or the IRA, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act created the largest climate and clean energy investment America has ever made. These bills provide federal funding for energy and climate resiliency improvements that can be used in houses of worship. This historic legislation offers rebates to nonprofits for the first time ever. 30% federal rebate on solar, backup batteries, and more. Next, before this IRA legislation, only homeowners and commercial entities with tax liability could claim tax credits when installing solar panels or other eligible technologies. Nonprofits had to do a complicated workaround. Well, now the direct pay options means that non-taxable entities such as houses of worship can also benefit from these credits. Next. There's a 30% rebate for nonprofits through direct pay to install solar, backup batteries, geothermal. Next. The direct pay process is still being determined by the IRS. It's in the comment period now. For solar, battery, geothermal, this is what we know. After you put your project into service, this is likely what will happen. A pre-filing registration will be required, an extra form filed with your annual 990. The rebate is likely to be received 6 to 12 months after filing. Next. And for the energy efficiency provisions like heat pumps, water heaters, appliances, and more, that process is still being determined. The benefit will likely be accessed through the transfer of the federal credit from the congregation to the service provider. The EV provisions are already out. You could buy your faith leader an EV at a great discount right now. And this slide that Trey has just put up, this is an important page to bookmark. This is Interfaith Power and Light's Federal Funding for Energy Work at Houses of Worship resource page. And um, we're keeping that page up to date with everything that we learn about this federal funding for nonprofits. In particular, there's a spreadsheet on that page um, that has all of the details that you can click on. So I definitely urge you to bookmark that. I'll be sending this link to Michael that he'll, he'll send this to you. Uh, in a follow-up email. So you can click on that, look at it, and uh, bookmark that. And there are also state and local incentives for some of these measures also, and Gregory can help you with those. And now I just wanted to share a process that a congregation can work through to go green. And go green can mean many things, but I mean uh, reduce the energy use of a congregational facility, reduce emissions, reduce operating costs, and access the federal funding to help pay for it. And I'm gonna be sending all of these resource links that I'm talking about to Michael who can pass them on to you. Next. So this is how the process goes in general. Form a green team to do the work, get advice from IPL's startup guide. We've got a startup guide on our webpage that I'll send you the link to. Then assess your facility, get an energy audit to see what needs to be improved. You need to know what you're looking at before you can make a plan, right? Measure your carbon footprint with IPL's Cool Congregations Calculator for Congregational Facilities. Just use the short form. When you go there, you'll see you have a choice for a short and a long. You just need the short one. 
just and the reason I tell you to do this is to get an initial benchmark of your carbon footprint. So once you've made changes to your building, you can measure it again to see your progress. And this is an important piece of information to use to persuade your congregation to support your plan. Many of your congregants are concerned about the impact of their carbon emissions on the environment and its impact on climate change. So if you can show that you are helping with the problem, then they'll be more likely to support your plan. And then finally, of course, make a plan. You need to create an action plan. It'll be based on what you learned when you had your energy audit, and um, you'll take into account how you can fund it with this new federal funding. Next. And many congregations are choosing a goal of zero carbon emissions, and it's entirely possible. To do this, they go all electric and get those electrons from renewable sources such as solar. And uh, next. And the first steps of your action plan are likely to be to increase your efficiency and use less energy. And here are some common steps that congregations take. The first one, weatherize your building, seal it up, insulate it, and ventilate it. And that can usually be done with volunteer help. Next, and switch to LED lighting. It's 80% more efficient, less maintenance costs also, and, um, and it reduces the, the need to uh, cool your building in the summer. Next and heat and cool your buildings with heat pumps that draw energy from the air or the ground to reduce the amount of energy that needs to be created to heat or cool your space or heat your water. This is St. Martin's Episcopal in Davis, California. They are 100% a zero carbon facility and those are air source heat pumps. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, cook on induction cooktops get off gas, it's way more efficient and there's no gas, so no indoor pollution. And you can get hot plate varieties that are way cheaper than replacing a whole stove. <clears throat> Next slide. And then to get your green electrons, you can buy them from Clean Power SF's Super Green program. Maybe you already know about that or Gregory can tell you more. Uh, and then install solar on your congregation if it's suitable. You could go with Revolve. They are a nonprofit organization financing solar with no upfront costs. If you go with them, tell them you heard about them from IPL. And many religious organizations have loans or lease programs for energy efficiency upgrades or renewables, for example, Catholic Energies. And if you download IPL solar financing guide for congregations. You can see a list of denominational resources for energy efficiency and renewables and more. And again, I'll send that link through. And next slide. The other thing you can do is watch IPL's recent solar financing for congregations webinar recording featuring Revolve director Andreas uh, Corellas. And um, I'll send the link to that as well. And the next slide, cool congregation certification. Okay. In addition to the resources I've already mentioned, IPL has two recognition programs. We're in the midst of our summer of certification right now. IPL recognizes congregations that have reduced emissions by 10% or more by making permanent changes through our cool congregations certification program. It's a national honor. There's no cost and IPL sends a package with a certificate and a window cling announcing your accomplishment as a certified coal congregation. And we also post a story about your accomplishment on our website. We share it through media and invite certified congregations to speak on webinars. And we offer this recognition and highlight the stories of certified congregations to inspire others to follow their example. In this way, we help build the community of people of faith leading the way in caring for our sacred earth. Next slide. And St. Teresa of Avila Parish is the only certified cool congregation in San Francisco. 
they installed solar on the Priory in 2016. And then in 2018, they decided to source their electricity for the House of Worship from Clean Power SF. And now both the church and the Priory get 100% of their electricity from renewable sources. And I can send you the link about uh, the, to our story about them as well. So you can read more about how they did that. But, you know, I'm sure there are congregations and religious organizations in San Francisco that are doing wonderful work in this area. And IPL would love to recognize your accomplishments. So I, I invite you to apply to be a certified cool congregation. SF Interfaith Council member congregations could start a support group for your congregations wanting to reduce climate change pollution and get certified. And Gregory would be a great coach. So you'll hear from them in just a minute. And I just want to plug one last resource. Next slide, please. So I invite you to join us on July 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific for a briefing with the U.S. Department of Energy on the climate and energy resources for faith communities. We'll learn more about how congregations can access federal funding then with more information, I'm sure, on uh, the exact uh, route of that payment to a congregation doing this work. And now I'll turn it over to Gregory. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory. I use they and he pronouns. Um, I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church in San Francisco, um, and I'm excited to be here. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about that you are probably familiar with is the idea of intersectionality. Um, a lot of people think of intersectionality as coming from uh, the, the, a legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, but people have been talking about intersectionality for a long time. And one of those people uh, was Reverend Benjamin Chavez Jr., a U, uh, United Church of Christ minister in North Carolina. And he's the guy who's uh, credited with naming environmental racism. So as a black man in a black congregation in a black neighborhood, they had a um, an agriculture facility or a pollution, some sort of uh, polluting, polluting facility come through. And in bypassing the rich neighborhood, of course, uh, try to put the facility there. And they react by saying, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, but it's this intersection of, of, of systemic racism and the injustices that come with that and how they're, they're, uh, the powers that be are often putting these uh, dirty, dirty uh, solutions or dirty plants or dirty uh, production sites in those neighborhoods. A perfect example is Bayview Hunters Point. Uh, if you know anything about Bayview Hunters Point, the whole land there is toxic. Um, and there's a lot of activism going on around that with environmental justice groups. But what's interesting is uh, your, the, the, the housing costs will go down if they find out that you live on toxic land. So a lot of the people who are long-term residents are like, well, wait, don't tell anyone we live on toxic land because we don't want our housing to go down. And then others are trying to fight for the solution on it. So it's complicated. Um, but I say that because we're all in this together and we cannot think of our, our climate justice movement work in the city as our individual church or our congregation, our synagogue, our temple, our mosque, our center of worship. We got to begin to think about how we're all in this together. Um, and I say that again, because a lot of these grants that are coming out, the government through years and years and years of hardcore frontline activism and voting and lobbying and all of that door knocking and all that hard work have come to recognize that they have red line black communities, that uh, immigrant communities and people also have been absolutely, indigenous people have been absolutely marginalized and ignored, um, indigenous people especially. Um, so BIPOC is the term that is often being used, which means black indigenous people of color. And so what the government's trying to say is, we want a lot of the funding that we have now that's becoming available to go to these communities that we've, we've not been serving very well. Um, so what a lot of times that means is a wealthy white church or congregation of some sort gets a little frustrated because the money is not going to them. And so the reason I tell you that we're all in this together is to say, well, one, you, there is money there, so let's figure out a way to do a, our own fundraising there. But partner with another congregation, partner with uh, communities across San Francisco uh, that live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods. 
get to know them, get to know your neighbor and work with them on environmental justice work. Often communities who are disadvantaged do not have access to all of the resources and knowledge that we might have about climate uh, justice. And so there's this move that you can make where financial stability can be brought to any sort of uh, congregational changes that want to be made. You can establish a relationship with more frontline communities. So there's a lot that can be done. Uh, then there are there are a lot of grants and a lot of funding sources that are available to wealthier congregations as well. Um, so don't get me wrong there. Uh, you do have to be a little bit more creative. Uh, they're often less about infrastructure and more about really creative projects. Uh, but let me look at my notes here so I don't get off too off track. <laughs> Um, so with the IRA grants, the federal grants, those are really for bigger projects. And so if you're thinking about wanting to do something with the IRA money, it's best to not think, let me put solar on my building. It's best to think, how can I get solar on six churches <laughs> or six communities? You know, Cathedral Hill, we could all come together um, and create some sort of network of resiliency. So there's this big idea and trendy and grant world right now with the government especially is resilience hubs. Um, all of this information you can find on our web, website, interfacepower.org. But resilience hubs are this great idea where when disaster strikes, when it's insanely hot and you don't have air conditioning, when the power goes out and you need medical devices charged, when, you know, when the air from the wildfire smoke is so bad that you need clean air but you don't have search filtration systems, then you, you don't want to go to DMV, you don't want to go to some government office, uh, but if you could go to your congregation, if you could go to a safe space like that, um, and that congregation had cleaner energy from, from solar panels, uh, maybe they had an air filtration system, maybe they had a permaculture garden like Joyce is referring to in the comments there. Um, but, but And what that does is that when the power goes out, you become um, a hub for the community. And in that, in that way, you can provide hospitality, clean air, charging stations, and whatnot. Now, what if you don't have the capacity to do certain things? Well, then the, in Cathedral Hill, the church next to you, the Lutheran church next to the Unitarian church could maybe take up the slack on certain projects. But all of a sudden you're working together. And so the, the, the grant is a much larger grant. Um, and so the funding is, uh, there's more funding and you're more likely to get the federal grant. Now the, the government, the state grants, the California grants, um, they're a little bit different. They're okay with smaller projects. So you could do the individual stuff. Um, I say all of that as if it's easy to apply for a grant. It's hard and it takes work. And that's why a lot of nonprofit organizations have people who literally just work on grants. We have that. <laughs> and so you really, really, really need to be committed to wanting to take these steps forward. You need to have a green team, not a green person, you know, uh, and, and then reach out, call us, email us, text me. <laughs> uh, and we can begin that process because it is a long process where, where it's, you have to do the audit and figure out where your energies and energy sources are coming from. You gotta do a community profile. So thinking about why and uh, who you're serving and how you're serving them. And all of this gets written up and sent in and you might get denied, you might get approved. And then there's all the processes of following up on the grant and reporting back and all that. And so don't think that it's just a plug and play IRA website that you can go to. It's not, it's a bit of a process. But if your church is there, your congregation, excuse me, is, is there and ready to take these steps forward, then if they reach out to us, we can begin to walk through and say, oh, well, if you're wanting to do that project, it's going to have to wait. But like Joyce, I've got, I've got community garden money. I have a friend down in South, South, Southern California who has offered, um, I can't even remember what the grant is, but it's for community garden and for teaching. The hard thing with the community garden, though, is you can't just have a gardener. You got to have gardeners <laughs> and they got they can't just plant it once they got to nurture it you know uh, but that money does exist so if the, if you have environmental projects if you just want to do a webinar and an interfaith webinar where two other ministers or from other congregations come together and we talk about climate justice those are also things we can do where you don't need a grant um, we can also come in and work with your congregation or uh, house of worship in any shape or form uh, on smaller scales and smaller scale levels so thinking about coming in and doing a message on uh, zero waste, um, or thinking about how the climate budget that London Mayor, uh, Mayor London Breed just passed through and how that's gonna affect us. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, we hope to work on resilient hubs. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this organization, SF Card, uh, but they work with disaster relief and are absolutely amazing. And Heather is one of the co-leaders there and she was a former Episcopal minister. And so uh, 
she's got it all figured out when it comes to uh, churches, congregations, and how to run these resilience hubs. Because, you know, she learned a lot working for the um, uh, Red, Red Cross, I think it was. And so in these disaster times, you know, we can be a resilience hub, but uh, there, there's gotta be someone who monitors the bathrooms if someone's in there for 45 minutes. There's gotta be, there, you know, there's little things that you just don't think of right away. You think green, eco, yay, clean air. And <laughs> Heather's there to remind as well, there's a couple other things. Uh, so we have community partners in the city that we can work with to do workshops and to train uh, the community on. Because again, it's not, a lot of these projects, you don't just wanna throw solar up there. You wanna tell everybody about the good news of solar and what it does and, and why it's important. Um, so I'll stop there and then we can uh, have a conversation. Gregory, thank you so much. Uh, you hit on some fascinating points. Uh, you, you know, our organization got started uh, in response to a homeless crisis as well as the Loma Prieta earthquake. And what I really liked about what you said was this encouragement to work in neighborhoods collaboratively. Uh, as you know, up on Cathedral Hill, uh, that, that is the epicenter of the Interfaith Winter Shelter, where, um, where the First Unitarian Universalist Church, St. Mary's uh, Cathedral, and St. Mark's uh, host uh, between uh, 40 and 100 uh, homeless folk, and we have 50 congregations that are are, are serving meals. Uh, but I think that that's, that really is the key, is to encourage congregations and neighborhoods to work together on these sort of things. I also was very impressed with, uh, uh, I think, Sarah, in your slideshow, you showed St. Teresa. St. Teresa was uh, of Avila was the epicenter of the sanctuary movement. And so in what you're talking about, a lot of these congregations who have been out there, activists are, are prime, prime uh, candidates for, for working with you all. I'd like to if, if bring in Sally, if that's okay. Sally, would you come back and join us uh, for a little conversation now? Uh, and if you'll permit me, uh, I think you, you, my dad used to say, you can, you can see where a person stands by where they sit. Um, Sally, can you just give us you know, a few words on how this whole effort got started uh, in the initial days and what your vision and was for the mission? Well, it's interesting that the different reasons that these organizations got started that you've just cited, Michael. Interfaith Power and Light was started because climate change was becoming the most egregious issue facing the world today. And we found in California that we could make changes and help alleviate the problem. And right now, California leads not just the, our country, but California is leading the world on what to do about climate change. And we've got all these initiatives to go electric and 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 money for people to retrofit and become more efficient and all the things that Sarah mentioned are because climate change was such an enormous issue and that's that's really why and how we got started doing this i i felt that every single religious person of whatever denomination they belong to needed to understand that god put adam in the garden to till it and to keep it and like it or not, we are the gardeners. We are the caretakers of this planet. And I love the conversation about the gardening. Um, and and somebody wrote in on the on the chat, what what are the vegetables that we can grow in San Francisco? Now that is a problem, but I think Sarah answered, you know, go go to the food bank and find out what grows here. I have vegetables in my garden, but it's not abundant. Mostly it's herbs. The tomatoes don't go. There's too much fog here, but there are so many outlying places around the Bay Area where you can have vast gardens and tons of produce. And I think, Sarah, you may know who it is, but there's a congregation that ripped up their parking lot and are growing vegetables, which is another thing that congregations can do Ask your parishioners to come on a bicycle to church and rip up that parking lot. I was in Los Altos last Sunday preaching at a church that was the, the parking lot was as big as the facility. And I thought they really don't need all this. And it was also very, very hot. Um, anyway, I'm getting off track, Michael. We started because of climate change. Thanks. I knew that it was I was talking to the scientists and I knew it was 
the biggest issue facing us, and we were going to kill ourselves if we didn't really do something about it. And now it's working, and 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 people are responding, and nobody says that's not a problem. Well, occasionally people say that's not a problem, but that's coming from misinformation. And we've been able through this Interfaith Power and Light program to really educate millions of people in the pews around the country on the subject of climate. So it's been a successful movement. Thank you, Sally. And on, on the issue of gardens, I remember 15 years ago when I started this uh, position that the beautiful St. Paulus Lutheran Church uh, uh, you know, that had burned down uh, before it turned into what it is now, which is housing and, and rebuilding the church. Uh, it was the free farm. And, uh, and uh, it, it was a place where uh, folks from all different congregations came and worked together to make something beautiful happen. And they used to take the, the vegetables uh, uh, and the produce uh, into the mission and and give them away at the farmer's market to the homeless. Uh, and it was just, it was a success story. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, and, and Gregory and Sarah, if you can uh, help refresh my memory and, and kind of give a, a 101, if you will, to, uh, to those who are listening in today. As I remember it, I mean, congregations become members of IPL and, and you talked about certification. Can you talk about what that process is like. If anybody on, online today has even a little bit of interest, what's the next step? What, you know, walk, give us, uh, walk us through this and, and also talk about what, what, what you have observed some of the challenges are uh, in people's minds and how to overcome them. Well, I can say that the first thing a listener might want to do is sign up to get the newsletter from Interfaith Power and Light. And I want to point out that there are two separate organizations, Interfaith Power and Light National, which I represent, and California Interfaith Power and Light, which is one of our state affiliates, which Gregory represents. So you're going to want to sign up for both newsletters. So you can get the, the download on uh, federal funding from IPL National, that's me, and you can get lots of good information on state-based resources from Gregory. So make sure you sign up for IPL National's uh, email list and also California IPL's email list. That's my first response. And um, for IPL National, you don't become a member. You just start doing stuff, take part in our programs, do your own work and use our resources. Um, and California IPL, tell me, what, do you become a member of California IPL, Gregory? You become a member by just participating. Um, and then we take the opportunity to uplift the work on our social media pages and our website and try to highlight it in our blog online and that kind of thing. So it's kind of uplifting and it's a lot, it's a lot like the certification programs within everyone's denomination. Um, I know that in the Unitarian uh, Church, we have uh, the Green Sanctuary Program that was recently updated. And it's actually where I got the idea of partnering with the congregation. That's one of the things that they have to do. If in the Unitarian Church wants certification, they do their own green team, but they then also have to partner with the community and the frontline community. Um, so that there's that partnership. But so each each congregation has, or each denomination, excuse me, usually has something along those lines as well. So yeah. it's fun to to get as many as you can. <laughs> I, I wanted to, oh, go ahead, Sarah, please. I was just going to answer your question about certification. Many Unitarians decide, in addition to being a green sanctuary congregation, to um, get certification as a cool congregation. Ours is kind of a higher bar in that we ask for actual energy use data. We ask you to prove that you've actually reduced your carbon emissions. But then, you know, you can be part of this fantastic uh, leading group of congregations that is highlighted nationally through national webinars like New York City Climate Week um, and others to inspire others to follow your example. And again, it's free to get certified, but once you've got it, you've really got something. To drill down on that a little, and, and Gregory, I was really pleased that you mentioned SF Card because they're an incredible partner of ours uh, and we steer people in their direction like we steer people in your direction. One of the things that SF Card does and I think you mentioned it, one of you mentioned it in your in your presentations, is uh, they will go in and help uh, to create a plan for a congregation for emergency response. D is that something the person who's just a little bit interested, uh, you know, and is 
probably a little overwhelmed. Uh, uh, how do I, you know, we have a building, uh, how do we make it more green? Do you all come in and assist with that plan? How does that work? Yeah, definitely. We, <clears throat> we have certain levels of knowledge though. So it's enjoyable to have um, someone from CARD come in because like I come to thinking about climate change through theology itself. So um, I didn't first think about solar panels or, the, or how electrification even works or anything. And so uh, I might miss things when I do a run through. But a lot of the things that I would see are a lot of the things that Sarah mentioned, with like the induction ovens, the air conditioning, the heaters, um, the leaky uh, windows and seals and that kind of thing. But what's fun is, yeah, Heather came with us. She might be able to take it up another level um, because her specialty is in more of the nitty gritty of those things. Where I could talk all day long about the green theology, she can tell us more of that kind of stuff. Uh, but no, that's absolutely something that we would, we would want to do and um, help coordinate. Sarah, did you want to add anything? I'm not familiar with SF card, but you should definitely do a webinar with Heather and Gregory. That sounds fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, Sally, um, now that you know we've got some congregations that are interested, I know, and you know the people's mindset, if somebody else has done it and done it well, a success story, um, uh, it, it kind of it kind of gives people a little uh, a little more incentive to you know to take the next step. Have you seen some success stories, Sally or or, or Gregory or Sarah, uh, that that you can share with us? And because I think that that would be helpful to know. Oh my gosh, there are so many success stories on the <laughs> IPL website. I'm writing them every day. Um, Any come to mind? Oh my goodness. Well, we just, if you watch that solar financing uh, webinar, you can learn a little bit more about Hope United Methodist Church in South San Francisco, which is a resiliency hub that worked with Revolve, a nonprofit in the area to get solar on the roof of their congregation and a backup battery. So they used to be able to offer, you know, to their neighbors, coffee, tea, comfort, and now they can also offer electricity to uh, in times of uh, power outages, um, just charge their cell phones and run their oxygen machines. They can offer a refuge from wildfire smoke with their filtered air. Um, so they're just really pleased to be this fantastic hub for their community and also to drastically slash their uh, energy bills drastically. That That is good to know. Uh, Sally, you, you were about to say something. I wanted to give you a chance. Well, I was going to ask if you had ever come to one of our Energy Oscar events at Grace Cathedral. We used to have a big event every year. It was called our Energy Oscars, and we would highlight congregations from all over California that had retrofitted or or ripped up the parking lot and put in um, vegetables. And the people would come to the cathedral and get an award. And it was it was actually a little statue like the, a like the Academy uh, Award. And then we were asked to cease and desist by the uh, Academy, the, the <laughs> Motion Picture Academy, because we were using Oscar as a name. But we do have a kind of, we've not said a lot about it yet, but California may do this again coming up soon. And then we ask congregations to put in an application for one of these awards. And we're hoping to be able to have those events going forward soon and do it once a year. And you would be utterly amazed at the team of people that will sometimes come in, the green team from a congregation will come in and stand there and do a little presentation and a slideshow on all the things they've done within their congregation. And it's utterly startling. And often it's the youth groups that have done it. And I can't it's kind of, I feel a little like Sarah felt when you said, well, name one. Um, it's a little hard for, there were so many, many congregations that got prizes from us over many years. And there are lists of them on the website. I also think if a congregation has done retrofitting and they can be carbon neutral or carbon zero carbon, they might even host an event and let folks come in and see all that they've done, where that's some more uh, hands-on. Gregory, you could probably arrange for that um, in California, and it would be have to be somewhat local. 
we did an event showing that people could afford and drive electric cars in Oakland. I mean, I think it was a year or two ago we went to Gregory, were you there? It was called Faith mm -hmm. Church. It was out, it was out in Oakland, and we had an event where we invited uh, automobile companies who make electric cars to bring them, put them in the parking lot, and then people could come and drive them. And there was a whole presentation on how this myth about them being too expensive is really wrong. It's not expensive. I mean, I I have an electric car, and yes, you have to pay for it up front, although you can get loans. I don't, I pass these gas stations now where the gas is $5 a, a gallon and I just kind of wave and keep on going. And I plug the car in on my 110 volt, the same thing my dryers uh, plugged into in the basement of my house. So it is not expensive to drive and um, they're, it's the way of the world. Two things on that as well. Speaking of relationship, relationship, relationship. If any of you have a relationship, or maybe it's you yourself with a BIPOC, a Black Indigenous People of Color majority congregation, we have a grant right now where we can give $250 to an individual, a green team, a church, um, if they present the Clean Vehicle Rebate Program, which is California's program that has you type in your, your income, the type of car you want, and it spits out all the rebates you can get. Um, and so uh, between 1000 and like $6,000, uh, but it's super, it's super easy. You basically explain what an EV car is and then say, oh my gosh, and there's money. Uh, but it's, it's kind of nice that we now have money to give someone, to give a congregation instead of just asking them to, <laughs> to do it. But if maybe you don't fit the bill of BIPOC, because maybe $250 isn't something you need either, but you would still love to share the CVRP information with your congregation. We can just reach out. We can also do um, a training there uh, because the rebates are still accessible to folks of all the various income levels. We'll ask you, Greg, uh, to, to get that information, a link or, or whatever, so we can share it with the recording link that will go out today to our 5,600 e-subscribers. Um, very, very important. I, maybe I, I asked the leading question because uh, our former board chair, uh, GL Hodge of Providence Baptist Church, uh, in the Bayview, which is which is the, the heart of the BIPOC community, if you will, um, uh, they they converted to solar panels, and I remember when they were doing it, uh, and you know he had to fight tooth and nail uh, because it was expensive, uh, and they they got some subsidies, yes, um, and then a year later, he with a proud heart was able to go before his board there at Providence and let them know what they saved. And it was, it was not inconsequential. It was, it was significant. And so I think that, uh, you know, to me, when I heard that story, uh, that, that is something that every congregation, not only are they doing good for the environment, but they're also, you know, uh, they're also able to save on energy bills in, in some pretty precarious economic times that we're heading into. So, you know, I just wanted to lift that up. Um, Wanted to, we had uh, William uh, Allschuller uh, early on in the uh, early on in the program asked a question offline and Sarah answered it offline. Um, but I think it would be of benefit for everybody to know. Um, he asked, "Is there a structure for co combining IRA funding with state funding, third-party funding, or bonding?" Glad you emphasized the energy records. Can you, uh, Sarah, give your uh, response to that? Yeah, sure. I was telling William, yes, you can combine sources of funding for your energy work at your congregation. Like for interest, for example, if you're interested in solar and you want to work with Revol, which is a local nonprofit organization, um, one of the ways they work with the congregation is through a PPA, which is basically a third party funding for the project. Um, and they can access those rebates. Revolve accesses those rebates from the IRA and then passes the savings on to the congregation. And so it's a way to combine the third party funding and the IRA funding. But yeah, the state funding is state funding, federal is federal. They can, you can match them up. And there's also, you know, stuff from your utility. They have incentives as well. Clean Power SF has, has incentives. So you could end up getting a real sweet deal if you combine all three of those things. 
And um, while I have the floor, I just want to clarify that um, Gregory is talking about applying for grants. That is different than the IRA funding. The IRA funding is not a grant. It's um, it's a rebate. Some people call it a rebate. Um, so you don't have to apply for a grant. You simply do the work and you send your paperwork into the government and they send you your check. So that's direct pay for you. So that's two entirely different things. There is a really big, wonderful federal grant that, that Gregory is talking about that takes a lot of work to apply for, but that's different than the IRA. IRA is accessible to anyone. Any nonprofit can take advantage of this. Excellent. Whether you're a congregation or a religious organization or a nonprofit of any kind, like a food bank, this kind of funding applies to you. Gregory, did you want to add anything? I, I thought I said. The only thing I wanted to add, which is tangential, is that all of the things we're talking about are only possible because another part of the work that we do is legislative lobbying and advocacy on a state level and federal level. And so if there's anybody on this call that's, that's interested in speaking directly with their um, senator or representative of some sort, that's also uh, what we've been working on. So we just got back from uh, Sacramento two weeks ago where we were pushing for certain bills uh, one of them is really cool. There's solar on highways and parking lots. One of them is bi-directional charging. So if you have an easy car and the power goes out, you could get some energy. You could use the, the, the energy that's in your car. Um, there's, you know, filling up old oil wells that they've left abandoned and, and are destroying the environment. A bunch of things. But we all got to go up there. And we're going to go again in August. Um, so if you're interested in those bigger lobbying things, we can also plug you in there. Yeah, I want to. Can we come back to that right now? Because um, I know we've talked, spent most of the time talking about um, uh, greening our congregations, but you have a whole advocacy arm too. Can you can you kind of talk about if somebody wanted to get involved with that, how they could, uh, what 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 are those advocacy days look like? Um, um, you know, to the person who knows nothing about this. Uh, and uh, what they could expect, you know, and, and, and how they could engage others to do that too. Mm -hmm. So we work in coalition with a bunch of different environmental organizations that are all eyeballing and researching different bills that are coming out from the assembly and the Senate. Um, and so then we as Interfaith Power, California Interfaith Power and Light have meetings with all of those people. And we kind of collectively decide what should we push on? Because we found that as a coalition, is sometimes if we're not on the same page, we will literally walk into the sending senator's office and say two different things, meet in the hallway, and then go, oh, crap, we should have coordinated because we just did that. And so, um, but then what we also have is people who are really good at policy and legislative stuff in, on our, in our network. And so they're constantly emailing and engaging. And so we create these small teams when it comes just before uh, June or August lobbying days. Uh, and we'll do a pre-seminar or like a webinar where someone who's either written on one of these bills or an environmental group uh, that's worked closely on one of them or someone super knowledgeable on the inside about the bill will share the information behind it to kind of give you an idea of, of what it, it is that we'd be pushing for. Um, and then we give you all the materials and we show up usually at a local congregation uh, that's nearby in Sacramento. Um, and we meet for coffee and we, we, we again have similar speakers come and kind of ramp each other up and uh, inform each other on more of what the bills are. And then we go in, in teams. And so each, per, each team will have one person who's definitely done it before, uh, but we will go in teams and there'll be someone who introduces themselves and there'll be someone who introduces the IPL and then the bill and we have this great conversation and then a little photo op at the end. But it's, it's really awesome and it's a really good experience. And you'll meet with about seven, between four and seven uh, representatives and you either meet with them or their staff. Um, often if you meet with their staff, they're there, they're just super busy. And so they'll pop out and say um, hello to you. But it really, it, you really see the democracy in action, you're doing it and it's really interesting. So um, I definitely encourage folks to come. If you are, well, none of you would be coming from Southern California. So I was gonna say, well, sometimes we have a little bit of money to help out with travel, but we can just carpool. <laughs> I usually take the train up actually, cause it's super easy damn check. Probably more environmentally conscious too. Sally, <laughs> you, you, you've been on the global stage uh, representing IPL and the Regeneration Project. Can you talk about some of, you know, how you know how you've brought a light to IPL in some of these places you've gone? I think you've gone to Davos and other places. 
<laughs> I have been to Davos, but I think the most uh, appropriate and and uh, the really the conferences that have meant the most to us and to IPL have been the COPs. Uh, I was in Paris when the Paris initiative was signed and sent forward. Um, meeting with people from all around the world who are part of the religious community and who are doing things um, with a religious voice is utterly amazing and how much of it is going on. I was with um, Senator, um, let me just think who was, oh, John Kerry invited the religious community to come into a small room when we were in Paris and looked around at us. And there were probably about six of us. And he said, what does the religious community want out of this? So having that chance to speak to people who are really leading leaders of the world about climate and what is it that the religious community has to say and, and why. Now that's been utterly fascinating. And I've been to, I think about four of the cops, the, the, uh, conference of partners no conferences what's what somebody tell me what that what does the p stand for it's a conference of parties where there are 192 nations or 196 nations all come together to talk about climate but i also had a really extraordinary experience by being invited by the ecumenical patriarch bartholomew to go oh you know that organization, don't you, Michael? <laughs> the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, which is 50 million people, um, he invited me to go out on one of his, um, symp he calls it a symposium. He, you're out on a, on a ship with 200 people, a third of which are religious leaders, a third are scientists, and a third are reporters. And then we go to environmentally uh, places that have been environmentally impacted by bad behavior and study it while we're there. And I've been on three of those um, symposiums with him, and that's been utterly amazing. I, I would do that again in a heartbeat. And the idea is that the scientists will tell us what the problem is. The religious people will come up with, okay, what's the, what's the religious response to this? And then the journalists job is to write about it when they all go back mm -hmm. to where they live. And I've met some fascinating people that way. And it's been, it's been quite a journey. You know, I just don't want anyone to think that they can suddenly call me and say, will you come talk to me about IPL? I am retired. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I really am retired. It's been three years since I had much to do with IPL. I'm still a priest, obviously. And, um, I'm going, and I do go to congregations and give talks about environmental stewardship all the time, but not necessarily related to interfaith power and light. Gregory, that puts an onus on you yeah. <laughs> to go out and talk. I, I, I'd like to pretty much bring this down because we're, we're at the end of the hour now uh, and, and kind of end where Gregory started. Um, you know, a lot of the folks on this line, you know, have pulpits. And and or or they're members of congregations that can talk to their faith leaders. I, I think that Gregory, in the beginning, you spoke about theology. Well, uh, you know, theology without practicing it, it it's it's not complete. And so I, I you know, our purpose, we have a unique role. Just as Sally said, you know, I, I think world leaders are looking for a moral compass, and uh, and a theological grounding. Uh, to help them uh, advance uh, environmental policy. Uh, uh, we can start it in our own congregations. We can be true to what's being preached. And so I think that uh, theology and, and practice go hand in hand. Uh, I, I, in the tradition in which I was raised, the, the sacred text in the Christian tradition, uh, to paraphrase the book of James, show me your works and I'll show you your faith. And on that note, I uh, want to say thank you to our presenters today. Uh, this, this has been a really, really a gift of time. Uh, we look forward to sharing all of the links uh, and resources as, as well as the PowerPoint and the recording link with our 
with our attendees as well as our 5,600 e-subscribers in the hope that uh, they will become members, if you will, of, uh, of IPL and the Northern California region in particular. Um, and uh, with that, I say God bless you and God keep you.